discussion about how should we do this? Should we have one person come out or all three of us? And we really screwed it right the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. What are we talking about today? You grew up in D.C.? I did. I was born and raised here. I'm a fifth generation Washington. Which is rare. Uh, I suppose it is. I run into that. Any fifth generation Washingtonians here other than siblings? <laughs> <laughs> You're sixth generation, I know you. You're my niece. Uh, yeah, I, my, uh, my mother was born here, and uh, her father and his, her father's both, both mom's parents were born. Both mom's parents were born. Yeah, a lot of us. Lot of us. <laughs> um, yeah, so and I, I never moved. I mean, I, we spent nine months in Palo Alto, California in 1974. My father, who was sitting here, um, uh, had a fellowship at Stanford. He was working at the Washington Post at the time, and he had a fellowship at Stanford. And we went to move uh, to spend nine months. I was in seventh grade. That was an extremely odd chapter of my life. Very strange to live in this town through the uh, 60s and early 70s, and then to find yourself in a place like Palo Alto, where um, the school dance and had bands, you know, which was just totally insane. I'd never had seen any. And the kids dated in seventh grade, which freaked me right out. Um, <laughs> and then we came back here, and I've been here ever since. What was DC like growing up here in the 70s? Well, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. 60s and 70s. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I think that the, uh, the city was, in my recollection, was pretty run down, extremely run down. But I kind of, kind of liked it. It just everything just seemed, you know, it was kind of wild westish for a kid. I mean, certainly in my neighborhood, there were a lot of people who grew up in Glover Park, which was just above Burleaf, which is just above Georgetown, around those constantly common streets. And uh, at that time, it was, I think there were quite a few um, kind of families who were working class kind of families who. Uh, <coughs> Maybe worked in the factories down on K Street, K Street underneath the by the river. At that time, there was a bunch of factories and uh, actually really stunk down there. I think there was maybe a a, a, pla a place where they melted boats to make glue or something. Um, it was pretty disgusting smelling down in Georgetown. Uh, and Glover Park was filled with kids, and so you just every day just went out on the streets and ran around. So. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of time spent exploring, but also being scared because there's this weird kind of sense of tension and violence. I think largely because of the Vietnam War, uh, but also because uh, the civil rights stuff that was going on, and just the general agitation in the, in, that was happening in the world. So I, I have this very clear recollection. We live quite near some woods. We call it BT, it's Glover Archibald Park. We would call it BT, and nobody has a clear water called BT Woods. But there was a, uh, don't know if it's true, but there was a, a story that a guy from Detroit, and this detail alone makes me think probably it's not true, but um, a guy from Detroit had killed somebody, chopped them up, put them in a garbage bag, and dumped it in the woods at BT. Um, so we were all terrified of the woods, but we would go to the woods. And then you saw a plastic bag and you just knew <laughs> <laughs> time to run. So I guess the point being that it was a very interesting time. There was a lot of um, a lot of protests happening. Obviously, there was a lot of anti-war protests, a lot of civil rights stuff going on. Uh, my family, uh, my parents were, you know, left people. So there was, uh, I feel like we were, we came face to face with a lot of people involved with those. Um, protests. We <clears throat> were members of St. Stephen's and Incarnation, which is an Episcopalian church at the corner of 16th and Newton Street, um, which practiced, you know, what I would call radical liberation theology. It was very much a street church, and um, we're challenging all conventional ideas about uh, how a church, what a church should be doing, whether a church should be ministering just within or also <clears throat> open to the without. And uh, at that church, uh, you know, I remember they had pulled out the first 10 or 15 rows of pews and put pillows on the floor. You know, and we sat on the floor and there was rock bands would play and, uh, you know, various, like, radical speakers. I think Stokely Carmichael? Did Stokely Carmichael? 
Tommy Carmichael this book? Mm -hmm. Or H. Rap Brown? I don't know. Right. You know H. Rap Brown, and, you know, it was quite close to the, it was a Black Panther headquarters. Directly across uh, Brown and uh, Newton Street, so the Panthers were around. And there was, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, sort of just forcing change. Like there was a, a woman named Alison Cheeks at Mass in 1972, I think, and that was, um, did not make the Episcopal uh, bosses very happy because um, women were supposed to say Mass at that time. And there was a, St. Stephen's was involved with that gay marriage in 1974. Uh, so I think that basically what I learned from church at that time was that you should really challenge conventional thinking. You should uh, not, you should question authority and you should uh, not trust the government necessarily. And uh, so it seemed very normal to me, very natural to me. That's the way I was raised in a way, just to, 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 uh, to think about things twice. Um, That's the opposite of the story you hear from a lot of people that grow up going to church. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was an unusual church. <laughs> uh, uh, Father uh, Bill Wint, who was the, the priest here, was a pretty, uh, he was a pretty incredible person, I think. He was a, he left, when he left St. Stephen's, he started uh, the St. Francis Burial Society, which was a, an organization that worked to sort of demystify and destigmatize death. And uh, one of the things he really promoted was this idea that everyone should build their own coffins um, and just use them as bookshelves or coffee tables. Um, <laughs> because it really would save their family a lot of agony um, and also would make them much less prone to be taken advantage of by a rather odious funeral industry. Um, he's a very interesting fellow. How, how did that do for him? It's, it's fantastic. It still exists. It's now called the William A. Wint Center, I believe. They still, and, and it also was not only about politics, it was about the idea of <laughs> counseling people and trying to get people to, to recognize that death is really the second most natural thing in life. And that's okay. It's okay. Uh, so I would say that it was, went pretty goddamn good for him. That's what I'm going to say. So, the, I, so I think that my experience of growing up here, uh, I also was really aware of the fact, you have to remember that in this town it was, as I said, it was. The protests came, but also tourists. So there's a constant flux. People are coming and going. And uh, for those of us who are of here, um, we just, um, I think we circle the wagons in a way to kind of feel connected to because you did have a sense of a disconnection, especially culturally. Because for white Washington, at least, um, you know, the culture that's sort of offered up to young people is really a federal culture. You know, you have you know, Hollywood, um, you, know, you, have, you have the TV station, you have major label music, but there isn't really, there wasn't a real sense of culture for white kids growing up here. Uh, and then you had the true culture of the city, which certainly at the time was a black culture, which in some ways was sort of out of, you know, and even though I, you know, I'm a native, but I had, it was still out of my reach because I just not like it, but like it. So you were a minority in school. I was a minority in school, certainly. I mean, my elementary school was Stoddard, which was pretty, that was a late school. My junior high school was Gordon Junior High, which is where um, on Wisconsin Avenue, right across from what is called the Central Safeway. I don't know if it's still called that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, currently part of the middle school, part of the um, well, That school, I believe, was 85 to 90% black. Um, and then Wilson High School I went to was probably 65 or 70 percent black. But certainly, yeah, Wilson, I mean, got me bored I was definitely impressionable. And it was hard. I, you know, I'll be honest, it was, it was scary. It was definitely, definitely got robbed. Definitely so you, got robbed. you get picked on and all of that from white? Well, of course. Not, not for being white, but being the other. There's a distinction. I don't actually think that it was like, you know, I think that the fact that I was white made me the other. But I think really, the kids who picked me were bullies. That's what they did. I mean, there's one kid, Franklin the Bruce. I know you're out there, Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> and he used, to, he used to rob me. He said, he said uh, got a quarter? No, I don't. See, I thought I could get by on that one. <laughs> he said, uh, he said uh, all I find I keep? That's a very scary question. You think about it. <laughs> I had one. And uh, I said, no. 
So he just punched him. He goes, that's the lion. That's the lion to me. Then I had to put him up. And then this kind of got repeated pretty much on a daily basis. And I finally said, like, Franklin, we're going to have to have a talk, you know. <laughs> can't, this has to stop. And he, uh, he said, uh, all right, we're good. Just give me one more, one more day. <laughs> and I said, all right. But then after that, we worked for square. And then, and then a couple days later, he jacked me again. He said, not for me, it's for my friend. And, <laughs> and I finally, and I know this had nothing to do with this probably a stinking show. I'm just telling you the story. <laughs> so finally, I, uh, I was like, how am I going to deal with this situation? I could not get out of it. It was, a, it was like a nightmare for me. And I, I came up with this idea. I sewed a pocket in the back of my jean jacket, just a small piece of fabric right in the back. And I was trying to make the stitches really small because it got to the point where he was searching me for money, you know. So I put, I had to get my first dance for a one dollar bill, fold it in half, and put it in the back. And then I put in my front pocket a quarter, a dime, a nickel, and a bus token. Um, so that day he came and he said, um, Yo, man, my friend needs some money. I said, Franklin, I said, in my pocket, I have 40 cents in a bus token. 40 cents is my lunch, my bus token is my way home. And if you take that, I gotta go to the principal. And he said, let me see. Took the show and he goes, take your shoes off. Take my shoes off. <laughs> and I, said, I said, all right? And he said, all right. And then we had a couple more days of that, but then after that, everything was good. And I could always go across the street and get a Butterscotch trimming, or whatever it was I just need the money for. But the point being, <laughs> um, it was just learning. It was navigating and learning about um, just living in the world, you know. And, and not like everybody there was, you know, not everyone was attacking. It was just, it was just, it was just a, a few kids. But it was, it was a different, it was, a, it was jarring. It was really jarring. And you have to also keep in mind that in the late 60s, you know, there were these terrible, terrible riots here. Um, and, and I was really, I mean, I was six years old when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and uh, I was terrified. You know, we, we, all the kids in the neighborhood were terrified, or these kids might age were, because we really thought it was like the end of the world, that the race war was off. Because it, you know, because we had soldiers, and, you know, it was just, and we, you know, the streets were burning. Um, so there was a, the hostility that kind of existed. I don't think of it, it was something, I don't think it was necessarily, uh, it was almost it was like it was madness that sort of seemed to s sort of just be seeping through all society. Those people were just crazy. So it makes sense a kid would be especially, it would manifest especially when kids uh, in their own already screwed up era when they're 13 or 14 years old. They got, you know, Wilson was not 